What we're seeing in the 21st century is a series of forces come together to create the perfect storm. One of them, I think, is the hollowing out of values as Western civilization becomes increasingly secularized. One of the things that neither science nor technology actually do, or all the market economy or the liberal democratic state, is answer the three big questions every reflective individual must ask themselves at some time. Who am I? Why am I here? How then shall I live? And religion, as it were, comes to, to, to enter and attempt to fill that vacuum. The second thing happening somewhere away in the Middle East, in Africa, and in Asia, is kind of religious counter-revolution against secular nationalist regimes that have been seen in various countries simply not to have delivered on their promises. And uh, if secularity won't work, goes the theory, let's get back to religion. Normally, this would happen and we'd have little conflagrations, local bonfires, if you like. This is not a forest fire. But something has happened to turn those little local uh, bonfires into something huge and very threatening. And that something is the uh, appearance of instantaneous global communication, the social networking media, that allow very extreme voices to become amplified and to be broadcast across the world and pick up support across the world. This is the challenge of our time. We are seeing not just climate change in the geographical and environmental sense, but in the spiritual sense. Religion that used to be a gentle breeze has now become a uh, very dangerous hurricane. So the real question is, what do we do confronted by a threat of this proportion? Number one, I think we have to go out to young people and deliver a a message of love as powerful as the message being delivered by the preachers of hate. It really has to speak to young people today. And we have to use the same social networking, the same technology as the extremists, and we've got to do it as well and better than they do. And that's not an impossible challenge because young people are naturally altruistic. They do not want to have to fight. They want to be able to build rather than destroy. Secondly, we have to share a religious message across a much broader public. We have to make common ground with secular humanists who are equally concerned for the future of our world and its freedoms. And thirdly, I think, we really have to work at friendship and respect across the faiths. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam have, have a fraught and troubled history. I call it a history of sibling rivalry. The time has now come to move beyond that. Brothers and sisters do not have to fight. We can live together in peace. I have tried to protest against what I see as a fundamental desecration of God's name. How much longer will we kill in the name of the God of life, wage war in the name of the God of peace, and practice cruelty in the name of the God of compassion? We, from all faiths, have to come together and say, this is not the only way, it is not the best way, it is not God's way, and it is not the way that will allow us to build a gracious future together. Love and power illustrate perfectly one of the great formula of game theory. Power is the ultimate zero-sum game. The more power I share, the less power I have. There's only so much to go around, so the more I give away, the less I have. Love is the exact opposite. The more I share, the more I have. Because love, like friendship, influence, even knowledge, is the kind of thing that I only ever really acquire by sharing. 
So that is why power is always connected with conflict, because I want more and that means less for you and therefore you must oppose me. Whereas love is always associated with cooperation, because it means that what we can do together is so much greater than what we could do alone. The way I read the Hebrew Bible, in Genesis 9, God makes a covenant with Noah and through him, with all humanity. In Genesis 17, he makes a covenant with Abraham and his descendants. And that is not the whole of humanity. And I was wrestling with this. If God has already made a covenant with everyone, why does he need to make another covenant with Abraham? And I think the short answer is this, that just as God creates biodiversity, he creates cultural diversity and indeed religious diversity. And I think we need both. We need a covenant of shared humanity and then we need a covenant of what I call the dignity of difference. And that corresponds to the two fundamental principles of the moral and spiritual life, the universality of justice and the particularity of love. Justice has to be done equally. Love is always particular. I love each of my children for what makes them different and unique. And if I fail to value that uniqueness, I would be failing to show them the deepest form of love. So God is the God of justice and of love. He is the God of universality and particularity. He is the God of all humanity in our sameness, but he's also the God of each section of humanity in our uniqueness. If there's anything we know about God from the Hebrew Bible, it is he is the God who loves creating. He is the God who loves diversity. So he created not one life form, but around a hundred million. He created not language, one language, but 6,000 different languages. He created not one kind of tree, but 250,000 varieties of tree. Because God loves diversity. He loves the unexpected. He loves the unpredictable. And uh, I think, oddly enough, Darwinian biology has shown us that. God made creation creative. And um, therefore, I see at the heart of monotheism, not the simple idea, one God, one truth, one way, but rather the strange miracle, the awe-inspiring miracle that unity in heaven creates diversity down here on earth. I think we're failing young people today. I really do. And I was alerted to this by an extraordinary book written by two American Christian teenagers a few years ago with a very striking title, Do Hard Things, subtitled A Teenager's Rebellion Against Low Expectations. They were really complaining about the fact that Western culture seems to constantly speak to our self-interest, our self-esteem, our self-regard. The icon of our age is the selfie. Now, young people actually are altruistic. They are inspired by high ideals. They are not yet cribbed, cabined, and confined by disillusionment or the sense that you can't really change the world. Young people are convinced that you can change the world. And if you believe it, you probably will. So I think we have to deliver a message which is quite different from that of liberal democratic politics and the market, both of which are entirely viable, but both of which speak to my self-interest. There has to be a third language, an altruistic, idealistic language that says you can change the world if we work hard enough and we work hard enough together. I've had the privilege of meeting a few young people who decided to change the world and actually succeeded. 
a few months ago, uh, my wife and I were visited by a young man called Adam Braun, 31 years old, who just wanted to meet and have a conversation. And he told us his story. His story was that uh, when he was a university student, he did something called Semester at Sea, which allows you to board a ship which travels around the world while you're still taking university courses. And in order really to enter into the spirit of each new country he visited, he decided he would ask a child at random what, if they could have anything in the world they would like, they would like to have. When he went to India, he took a, a child from the streets and asked him that question. And the child, a street child living in poverty, said to him, a pencil. And he said, no, you can have anything you like. And he said, a pencil. <laughs> so Adam gave him a pencil. And then he got back on the ship. And sometime later, the ship was vo involved in a storm where everyone on the ship thought they were going to capsize and drown. And they didn't. And he felt, my life has been saved for some purpose. What is it? And his mind went back to this Indian child. And he suddenly realized, if I could just give children in, in a poor country who have no chance of an education, if I could build a school for them, that would be a way of giving back something for the fact that my life has been saved. So he built a school. He was working for a management consultant firm in New York. And he, using all his management skills and social networking technology, he got together the people to help him build a school in Laos. And by the time I met him at the age of 31, he had built 300 schools around the world. And I thought, that is one young person driven by a sense of possibility who has changed the world for thousands and maybe tens of thousands of people. I think stories like that inspire young people because they simply don't know the word impossible. And we need to capture that energy. The challenge to faith of the existence of evil, how can a good God allow evil to flourish in the world, is the oldest and deepest challenge to faith. If we look in the Bible, we see it's not asked by the skeptics. It is asked by the real heroes and heroines of faith. Abraham asks, shall the judge of all the earth not do justice? Moses says, how and why have you done evil to this people? The whole book of Job is taken up with this question. And I asked myself that question as I stood for the first time in Auschwitz-Birkenau, where in the space of a couple of years, a million and a quarter human beings, including quarter of a million children, were gassed, burned, and turned to ash. Where was God at Auschwitz? And suddenly standing there, the answer came to me. God was in the words, thou shalt not murder. He was there in the words, thou shalt not oppress a stranger. He was there in the words, your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. And when God speaks and human beings don't listen, there is nothing even an all-powerful God can do. Because if there is one thing he will never do, it is take away our freedom. I call the faith of the Hebrew Bible God's call to responsibility. He is telling us I alone cannot eliminate evil from the world and still allow you to be human, still allow you to be free. Therefore, I need your help in putting out the fire that is consuming civilization in its flames. The capacity for forgiveness as such is not an intrinsic part of human nature. We know that um, all sophisticated life, and it, this applies to primates as well as to humans, have conflict resolution techniques. Uh, you can call those appeasement. The Greeks, 
the ancient Greeks had this concept of appeasement. I didn't do it, or if I did, it wasn't that important, or if it was that important, I feel bad about it. And you go through a gesture of submission and self-abasement, and you hope that somebody will forget the offense against them. Forgiveness as such only enters the world when we move from what is called a shame ethic to a guilt ethic. And a guilt ethic separates between the act and the person. The act was bad, but the person remains deep down, untarnished. And therefore, um, that, that sense of when I repent and make restitution and so on, I am capable not of just making you forget the whole thing or ignore it, but actually do this extraordinary act called forgiving, which appears really in human history with the story of Joseph and his brothers at the very end of Genesis. Um, um, his brothers have wanted to kill him. They sold him as a slave. And eventually he reconciles with them and forgives them. And fascinatingly, it's only after that that God forgives. He forgives the Israelites for the sin of the golden calf after the pleadings of Moses. So forgiveness has to do with a specific culture. It is one of the great contributions of the Judeo-Christian heritage to humankind. And it was Hannah Arendt who pointed out how very, very important forgiveness is because it is one of the very few things that breaks the hold of the past. It liberates us from this eternal consequence and the eternal echo of the bad things we've done in the past. It allows us to create a new world going forward. So I think some form of conflict resolution is universal. But this very specific form of forgiveness is one of the great gifts of the Judeo-Christian heritage to humankind. Scientific knowledge doesn't contradict religious belief, and I believe religiously that it can't contradict religious belief because the God of Revelation, the God we encounter in our sacred texts, is also the God of creation. So one way or another, there is a kinship, a substantial coexistence between the world of science and the world of religion. But they really are very different worlds. Uh, the way I put it is science takes things apart to see how they work. Religion puts things together to see what they mean. And those are different mental functions. They even use different bits of the brain. One of the really most interesting points, though, is that religion can affect the way we understand science and the other way around. Science can affect the way we understand religion. We know that Charles Darwin personally found his theory of natural selection incompatible with his faith as a Christian, but I think 150 years on, we can see that Darwin unintentionally and perhaps unwittingly hit on one of the most beautiful religious truths ever discovered, which is that the creator made creation creative. That's what Darwinism is. So here you have science allowing us to see that God isn't quite as simple as we thought he was. In fact, God turns out to be much more like a gardener and a teacher than what 18th century thinkers thought he was, namely a mechanic, a clockmaker. So science does cause us to adjust and refine our religious beliefs and make them much more interesting, I think. My doctoral supervisor, the late Sir Bernard Williams, was an atheist, quite a passionate atheist, I have to say. But I learned a great deal from him as an atheist as to what faith actually means, even if you're an atheist. What fascinated him was the story of the painter Gauguin. Paul Gauguin gave up everything, his life, as a Parisian stockbroker 
to go to Tahiti and become an artist. Now, what Bernard Williams pointed out is there were no facts that Gauguin could have established at the time when he made the decision that would have justified the decision. He didn't know when he was thinking, shall I go to Tahiti, will I be a great artist or not? So it's clear that Gauguin made his decision on the basis of faith, not religious faith, but faith nonetheless. He had faith in himself. And religious faith, I define as faith in God's faith in us. So I think there are ways in which a non-religious person can understand faith. To put it slightly more concretely, we have always, as human beings, sought that point just beyond the visible horizon. That's what led to the great pursuit of scientific advance, this sense that there was an answer just beyond the horizon. It's what leads to great creativity in any field. And when human beings reach beyond the physical horizon, the horizon of the strictly material, they reach out to a transcendent God. So I think science and art are built on a kind of secular version of religious faith. Whether we stand at the beginning or the end of God's creative process is very much up to us uh, because we are co-authors of the script. You know, there is a mistake that people make. They confuse a prophecy and a prediction. They're both ways of speaking about the future, but they are very different ways of speaking about the future. If a prediction comes true, it has succeeded. If a prophecy comes true, it has failed. If Jeremiah is right in saying that Jerusalem is about to be destroyed, his prophecy has failed. Because a prophet warns. He tells us what it will happen unless we respond to the challenge of our time. And right now the world is full of predictions, but we don't have enough prophecy. A prophet is a person who, in the deepest night of dark despair, sees the first glimmer of hope and leads us towards it. And I think religion today, in the 21st century, has to speak to young people by giving, a, giving us a vision of the future. Just look at the extraordinary powers that we have developed in medical technology in reducing infant mortality, extending life expectancy. Look at these extraordinary powers we have had in increasing our capacity to create wealth or decode the human genome or chart the birth of galaxies and even now detect waves in, in uh, the gravitational field. The question is, will we use this for good or, God forbid, for harm? Every single new power that we have comes with a call from heaven saying, use this to enhance life and not, God forbid, to destroy it. Use it to increase our humility rather than the arrogance of power. Use it to share blessings more widely so that Everyone, every single human being, feels that he or she has dignity. So right now, I think the future is calling to us. God's voice, actually, is a call from the future. Walk towards me, and I will walk towards you.